So Nikola Jokic is in the midst of what's looking like a third straight NBA MVP season. He has his Denver Nuggets leading the Western Conference as of recording. And as of recording as well, he's averaging a triple-double, 24 points, nearly 12 boards, and 10 assists to go along with it. In fact, statistically and team record-wise, this is a better season than his previous two. So a third straight NBA MVP is looking increasingly likely for the seven-foot Serbian, but, 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 not everyone is loving the prospect of Nikola Jokic taking home a third straight MVP award. ESPN's Hallmark Show first take often debates such topics, and one Kendrick Perkins was not too happy with this notion of Nikola Jokic taking home another MVP award. Here's what he had to say. When I come on here every single time and I ask, what is the criteria for the MVP and how the goalposts is move? I'm asking these questions for a reason. And so when I, when I look at JJ and I hear him talk because he's so big in analytics and he's, he's a historian when it comes down to diving in deep and going back into history and talking about the evolution of the game, why didn't he never bring up this in particular subject? When it comes down to guys winning MVP since 1990, it's only three guys that won the MVP that wasn't top 10 in scoring. Do you know who those three guys were? Who were they? Steve Nash, Jokic, and uh, Dirk Nowinski. No. Dirk Nowinski. <laughs> what, do the, what do those guys have in common? I'll let, you sit, I'll let it sit there and marinate. So I guess it's our turn to marinate that. I can't help but no. laugh. I can't help but laugh at that that last picture of of Dirk and and that. But for, before we get into it, lot to lot to get into. Jay, how are you, my brother? I'm doing well, man. Listen, I'm I'm ready to hear what you got to say about Young Perk. Listen, I I uh, I do have a lot of respect for Kendrick Perkins, and and you know he did have a good career, and I honestly think he does do a good job as an analyst for the most part. And uh, I'll, I'll say this as well, like. What what he said, I don't think it's racist. I don't think as a white guy, I'm not bothered by it. I'm not offended by it. You know, I I disagree with a lot of what he said. I agree with some of what he said. I think he's flat out wrong in some of what he said. And I disagree with some of what he said, all of which we're going to get into. Uh, but when you disagree with somebody in a topic that has to do with race, to me, the answer is never get this guy off the air, take his microphone away. To me, the answer is never cancel culture. I've never been into that. Yeah, man. I've always, I've always been a guy that's under the impression of if you strongly disagree with somebody for something they're saying about race and someone you think someone is so wrong, the answer is more conversation. The answer is challenge them on it. The answer is use your first amendment, right? To tell somebody why you think they're wrong. And so for that reason, I don't think Kendrick Perkins is a bad person for saying this, but I do think he is off on a lot of it. And so I want to talk about it. Let's dive into it. So I'll start with where I agree with Perk. I think that's a good place to start because he said something very important. He talked about how, and I'll add this also, we did, he, he went on this topic for about four whole minutes. We only played about a minute of it. I never want to be that journalist who just takes a snippet of what someone says and, you know, portrays it as yeah, fact yeah. or the whole story. So do yourself a favor, do your own research, watch, go the, whole look at, video. watch the whole video. If you can find the, the whole segment, do that. Because again, I never want to be that guy that just takes one snippet and, and reacts solely off that. So he had a very important line in there. He talked about this idea that we, the NBA community, moves the goalposts every year for the NBA award. And I wholeheartedly agree with this. All right. You can point to multiple occasions where the NBA MVP was given to player X when player Y probably deserved it. I'll give you one quick example. 2011, Derrick Rose won the MVP over LeBron, despite LeBron leading Derrick Rose in points, rebounds, blocks, steals, minutes, field goal percentage, effective field goal percentage, true shooting percentage, whatever that is, offensive win shares, defensive win shares, plus minus and net rating differential. We can go on and on about examples, you know, Nash, Nowitzki, 
I know the Nash Kobe year was always a big debate. We can go on and on and on about examples where player X won it and player Y should have. I'm not here to debate that. But I will ask this. Why does that happen? Why do we move these proverbial goalposts when talking about the NBA MVP award? To me, when Perk says this, he's saying what I've been saying for a long time. And that's that the NBA, the NBA MVP award is no longer about being the most valuable player. It's about being the most outstanding player, right? Mm. It's, it's become more true to being strictly a regular season award that highlights the guy with the most outstanding performances, the best storylines, and the best wow factor. And you may be listening to me and say, Henry, that's so arbitrary. That's my point. This has become a very arbitrary award that has very little to do with a player's true value in the league. Now, what do I mean by this? True value in the league. Because again, kind of an arbitrary thing. So let's use football as an example. Soccer, that is, as we call it here in America. Let's talk about soccer for a second. If you don't know, if you're not a soccer fan, European football also has a similar MVP award. Obviously, there's di- there's different leagues, so it's tough. Uh, you know, each league has its own Golden Boot winner, but there's an overall European football award called the Ballon d'Or. If you're not familiar, it's essentially just the MVP, best player in Europe for soccer. Mm-hmm. Now, for the Ballon d'Or, from 2008, I'll use this span, from 2008 to right now, four different players have won the Ballon d'Or. That's Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Luka Modric, and most recently, Karim Benzema. All great players. Over that same span in the NBA, nine guys have won it. Kobe, LeBron, Derrick Rose, KD, Steph, Harden, Westbrook, Giannis. And Jokic, excuse me. The reason for this, four guys compared to nine guys, is because soccer historically is a sport that has, in my opinion, done a much better job keeping its proverbial MVP award to its true definition. Yeah, the highest of high standards. And I'll give you an example. In 2019, Lionel Messi won the award, right? However, there's a player on Liverpool named Virgil van Dijk. He arguably had a better season. Well, no, he definitely had a better individual season and arguably his club as well. That season, Van Dyke led Liverpool to a Champions League trophy. That's the granddaddy of them all if you're not a soccer fan. Champions League is the highest level after World Cup. It's the biggest trophy you can win in club football. He won it that year. He also helped his side to the third most points in the history of the Premier League. And as the best defender in the league, he led a defense that conceded only 22 goals and had... 21 clean sheets. He nearly certainly had a better season than Lionel Messi, but Messi still won the award. One, but Messi still won the award. Why? Because not a single soccer fan, not a single soccer owner, not a single soccer coach would ever think twice about the notion that Virgil van Dijk is a better player than Lionel Messi. Of course he's not. No one thinks that. So despite having a better season, the award didn't go to the most outstanding player. It went to the most valuable player. And soccer, in my opinion, has done a much better job of keeping this award true to its definition than the NBA has. Because if the NBA was based truly off of players' value, and now this is up for debate, but we would have only had four, maybe five winners over the last 20 years. LeBron, Kobe, Steph, KD, Giannis, you know, maybe wait. Like, that's where it gets a little more interesting. But you see my point. There yeah. are very few guys who you objectively, objectively would say, that's the, the most value guy, most valuable guy you can have on your team. So for that reason, I agree. Kendrick Perkins is fully on the money when he says we move the goalposts because we do. Mm. And I don't have an issue with that. Do you have an issue with that? Yes, I do have an issue with that. I mean, you should keep it to one standard and stay there. 
You understand? The most valuable player of the NBA, right? So out of all 31, 32, how many other teams there are, you are saying who's the most valuable player. So there's a lot of things that has to come into context. One, longevity. I know they have a mark on certain amount of games that you must play to even be considered an MVP, right? But it should be a little higher because guys sit out games and you still consider them guys. Like when you're talking about Nikola Jokic, he's durable. He's not sitting out. I don't know how many games I've seen him sit out. I, I think that it's a good point. And again, I don't want to get you know too deep into like, uh, you know, well, Jokic deserves it because of this and this and this. I, I, for what it's worth, and I don't want to get into this too much, but Jason Tatum is my MVP this year. Again, no no need. This isn't the point of this. Uh, I, I, I have no issue with Jokic winning it. But let's go back to Kendrick Perkins because that's where I agree with him. I just spent eight minutes explaining where I agree with him. I'm going to tell you why I disagree with him. But first, I'm going to tell you why he's just wrong. Okay? If you're going to throw out this type of argument – and mind you, the whole crux of his argument is based around these guys, yes, being white, but also not being in the top 10 in scoring, right? So he's insinuating that they're getting this bonus points, these bonus points, and we're making reasons for them to win it and giving them extra charity despite them not being in the top 10 in scoring. Okay. Last year, Nikola Jokic was sixth in the NBA in scoring. Okay. So you're just, he's just wrong. (laughs) And the year, his first MVP year, Jokic, he was tied for 10th with Donovan Mitchell and Jason Tatum at 26.4. So for Jokic, you want to tell me he hasn't been in the top 10. Well, you're. And the, the eight, nine, 10 Hank be like 0.9. Either way. I don't, I don't care if it's 0.009. He was sixth last year. And right. the year before that, he was tied for 10th. So for you to make that a, such a big part of your argument and not even double check, man. Okay, and let's talk about Dirk. Come on, KP. You got to do better, man. Let's talk about Dirk because in 2007, Dirk was also tied for 10th with one Tracy McGrady at 24.6 points per game. And on top of that, if you adjusted for today's rules with the sitting out adjustments – Dirk would be seventh in scoring. So not only is Kendrick Perkins, dare I say, race baiting a little bit with this argument, but he's just factually incorrect with his numbers. Now, Steve Nash was not even close to the top 10. He averaged, he was putting up 15 beans a game. He did lead the league in assists and the next. I was going to say he was number one in assists, though. He was number one in assists by. over a hundred. The next closest guy was a hundred, more than a hundred behind him. So, again, he. I have no scoring numbers to say about Steve Nash, but the other two guys, Dirk and more notably Jokic. I mean, he's just simply simply wrong. Wrong. Now, let's talk about where I disagree with him. There's a reason a lot of people agree with him, and I. I If you think they are getting some sort of white privilege from this, if you think NBA MVP voters are sometimes voting based off race, you can think that. I I don't even necessarily disagree. I think race certainly plays a role in this. For me to say it doesn't would be me saying I can go inside the minds of each of these NBA MVP voters and tell you definitively that they're not factoring in race. I can't do that. that. They very well could be factoring race. So for Kendrick Perkins to say that and for you to agree, that's fine. I don't, I'm not going to call you racist. I don't think any less of you for thinking that. But a lot of people do disagree, including myself, and here's why. My guess is that a lot of people who disagree with these comments about white guys, there are a lot of sports fans who obviously grew up playing sports. Not all, but a lot. And most people who grew up playing sports, like myself, like you, were taught from a very young age 
the value of teamwork. And you're going to say, oh, this dude's corny, l take, whatever. Say what you want. But we were all at some point playing team sports taught the values of teamwork, right? right. The, the value in working together to accomplish one goal that we all have, winning. And when you're taught the value of teamwork, often you're taught that it does not matter what your teammates look like, where your teammates come from, what their speech <laughs> is, or what language they speak. You all have one goal, and to me, that's what makes sports such a beautiful thing. It's all of us coming together, regardless of what we look like, what language we speak, what car you're driving, what car your parents are dropping you off in. It's about coming together as a team and trying to accomplish one goal to the best of your ability. So that's why a lot of people reject Kendrick Perkins even bringing this up because a lot of sports fans don't want to hear about that. I'm not saying there aren't racism issues that exist in sports and exist in this country, but I'm also saying there are a lot of sports fans who just don't want to hear that. They don't care that Jokic is white. They care that he's dropping. Average in a triple double. (laughs) Yeah. They care that he's dropping, dropping dime after dime entertaining and one of the best players in the league. Right. There are plenty of sports fans like you and me who we look at Jokic and we see that. Yeah. Is it funny that he's kind of like a fat, goofy white guy? Yeah, sure. I, I can laugh at that. I think that's hilarious. But when you have Kendrick Perkins saying things like this, it's surprising, but it but it also isn't. One, it's surprising because he was a player who played on some really good teams under some really smart coaching minds. So it is a little surprising to hear him bring this up. But it's also not surprising because of this. And Jason, this is where I'm going to ask you a question. For a long time now, who have I, despite my six-foot, scrawny, white, 158-pound soaking wet frame, who have I always compared my game to? Mr. Serge Ibaka. (laughs) Mr. Serge motherfucking (laughs) Ibaka. And for a long time, it's been a joke, right? Obviously, I'm not fucking Serge Ibaka. I'm much closer to Kevin Herter than I am to, I'll ever be to Serge Ibaka. But one of the reasons I always... Or JJ, the guy who he's... Or JJ. Talking to, yeah. But one of the reasons I always jokingly, half jokingly, half seriously compared myself to Serge Ibaka is because he's always been one of my favorite guys for how he carries himself as a player, as a person, his work ethic, the way he treats his teammates, and the way he treats his community. I've always loved Serge Ibaka. Shout all. out Serge Ibaka, man. And not too long ago, one Kendrick Perkins had a comment about Serge Ibaka. He said Serge Ibaka, he was referring to his time playing with him on OKC, talking about how young of a group they were. And he said, Serge Ibaka is 21, although he was probably 30 at the time because we already know how certain individuals lie about their age. But we're not going to get into that, is what Kendrick Perkins said, which, mind you, is an offensive thing to say. And, you know, he's insinuating because he comes from an underdeveloped area in Africa that he would lie about his age. That's he, You can act like that's not what he was getting at, but it is obviously what Kendrick Perkins... <laughs> it's crazy to think, at. but it has happened. It, 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 sure, it's <laughs> happened, but... Serge Ibaka fired back, right, on Twitter. And mind you, this is a man who's been a class act his entire career. Serge Ibaka is not one to go into beef. And here's what he said on Twitter. Hey, Kendra Perkins, I count my blessings every day, and I don't usually react to comments about me, but it's disappointing to hear someone I shared a locker room with spreading misinformation to be relevant and get views on TV and social media. Clickbait. You can talk about my game if I don't play well. I will never have a problem with that. But to talk extra for no reason is really not acceptable. It is disrespectful to me, and I feel it is disrespectful to many Africans who have to live with that unfounded accusation. If I was 30 in OKC, I guess I'm 45 now. The truth is I never lied about my age, and I worked extremely hard every day without cheating, and I have never been suspended. Everyone in the league knows that you cheated and didn't disrespect and 
disrespected the game. He spelled it wrong, but he meant to say, and you disrespected the game. Although I am disappointed, I am not surprised to see these actions from someone who got his job by breaking the locker room code and by spreading lies about two of his teammates and brothers like KD and Russ. When KD had a bad game, you criticized him behind his back, and when Russ had a bad game, you then criticized him. You were not a locker room leader, and then you continued doing the same in the media. I understand everyone needs to do their job and take care of their families, but you are proof that not everybody knows how to do it with class and dignity. I have more to say about you, but I am not that kind of person. But this time, you went too far. Flames. Serge Ibaka from the top fucking rope. Now, uh, this is the last How did Kendrick Perkins cheat? I'm not sure what he meant by that. Not important. But I still want to know. We'll figure that out. (laughs) But the reason I bring that up is because there was one very important message in there that he said that I'm going to end this episode by referring to. And he talked about how when KD had a bad game, you criticized him, blah, blah, blah. You were not a locker room leader. And then you continued doing the same in the media. Now, a lot of you know, I used to work at ESPN, have people at that company who I'd give them the shirt off my back and they would do the same for me. I, I didn't leave ESPN in a bad way. I have a lot of love and a lot of, you know, admiration for my time at ESPN and everything I learned there. I wouldn't be the person I am today without my time at ESPN. But ESPN, like every other media outlet, has an agenda. And Kendrick Perkins fits perfectly into this agenda. Why why do I say that? Because what ESPN won't tell you, but will show you, is that they will put on guys like Kendrick Perkins to drop these comments for us to then react to. And it worked. (laughs) Kendrick Perkins dropped these comments somewhat, you know, I I don't think they're racist, but I'll say these race-baiting type comments about Nikola Jokic. And this, my friend, is how sausage is made. Because... He drops this, and then what happens? An absolute Twitter storm of people like me, people like you, coming to his defense or coming out to say how wrong he is and how right I am. And it all results in ESPN getting the attention, getting the clicks, and getting more money. And that, my friends, is how sausage is made. Be (laughs) Be a friend of a friend. Go like, go subscribe. We love all you guys. Bow!